to get the same amount of caffeine that you'd get by drinking two monster energy drinks, you'd have to drink 14 12 ounce cans of Coca Cola. The fuel E85 isn't as efficient. Drivers can get more miles per gallon from E15, which makes it cheaper in the long run. The best selling firearms are shotguns, just like this one. They've sold five of these within the past two days, and not even including the transfers from online purchases. Students' home stretching techniques, like this one, could lead to better memory, which in turn could lead to better grades. When you get documents in the mail that you may want to get rid of, you have two choices. Either throw them right away in a trash bin, or you can take a safer step by shredding them. Every Thursday, KU senior Nathan Fordyce has classes from 9 in the morning to 9 in the evening. To make it through the 12 hours on campus, Fordyce says energy drinks become a must. I like full throttle, monster, you know, whichever one's closest for me to grab. Fordyce says he likes the taste of energy drinks and they give him more of a boost than a regular Coke. However, he says he doesn't know how much caffeine he is consuming since it's not labeled on the can. To get the same amount of caffeine that you'd get by drinking two monster energy drinks, you'd have to drink 14 12 ounce cans of Coca Cola. Recently, the Food and Drug Administration received five reports in the past three years which suggest that people died after drinking caffeinated energy drinks. KU Public Health Educator Ken Suburbs says although no exact number shows how much caffeine is too much, there are warning signs people can look for. They're going to have rapid heartbeat. Their blood pressure is going to climb through the roof. They're going to have trouble sleeping. If they're having any types of these symptoms, if they're shaking, then those are some key signs that their levels of caffeine are definitely getting too high for their body to be able to handle that. Saber says the key is moderation. He suggests for those who are going to consume caffeine to pay attention to serving sizes on the cans, limit intake, and drink slowly. Shaolin Chen, KUJH TV News. The Lawrence Humane Society might not be the first place most people would go to find a new pet. Unlike a pet store, the shelter is filled with animals who are strayed, orphaned, or unwanted by their owners. We've had owners who have lost their job and they just can no longer afford the animal. Maybe they've moved. Um, landlords sometimes don't allow pets. Helping these pets get adopted and finding them permanent homes became a little easier when volunteer photographer Brenda Gatt arrived. Hello, Blue! Every Wednesday, Gatt comes to the shelter and captures enduring portraits of dogs that are newly available for adoption. She's now been photographing dogs nice at the shelter boy. for three years. Nice boy! Oh, you beauty! Every dog deserves a home and a good home, but various dogs take a lot more work. You can't just move them right in and expect everything to be wonderful. So Gad tried all kinds of different methods nice. to get the dog's attention and entice them into best posing for a photograph. Primarily food and squeaky toys. Um, a lot of dogs are game oriented. So if they hear a squeaky toy, they think, oh, there's a game happening. They suddenly feel very relaxed and then, what? <laughs> nice one. Yay. Yay. The pictures Gat takes become advertisements that the agency uses on its website to find homes for the pets. She tries to make the photos creative and loving. A dog with pearl on it, a dog with a jeweled tiara, a dog with a pair of sunglasses, and even a dog wearing a suit to get married. The photos really draw people in. Um, you know, a photo can just, it can kind of make or break the adoption. Hollingsworth says a lot of pets are out of the shelter and now in new homes thanks to the help of Brenda Gatt's warm heart in her lens. Charlene Chen, KUJH TV News. Every Tuesday, Jennifer Thornton and her husband Jason take their four-year-old out for his skating class. However, this week is a special trip. Guess what? Daddy's gonna try. Daddy, go get your skates. 
For Jennifer, it's the first time to see her husband and son skating together. When Jason returned from Iraq in 2008, after serving two combat tours, he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Right away, I mean, just not acting the same, um, shutting the world out. Jason still has a long way to get back to a normal routine. Life for the couple has been much different ever since he returned. Our life kind of has two parts now, before and after. And so when I see it, we look different. Our life was different. So much different that they are now having what is called the new normal, a term that is commonly shared in the wounded warrior community. I don't really like it because there's nothing normal about it. It's our new life, but it's not our new normal because it's not normal, the things that, that we deal with. Jason's struggles have inspired Jennifer. Recently, she received the first ever Wounded Warrior Scholarship from the University of Kansas so she could pursue a career in social work. Mike Denny is a director of KU's graduate military programs. He says the scholarship is awarded to assist injured veterans and family members who are identified as primary caregivers. This is just a great opportunity for KU to bring in somebody that um, is currently a primary caregiver, caregiver but has the desires to be a voice um, and an advocate for an entire community of the people that we're trying to serve. I'm so excited. Really like something's actually going right for us. While Jennifer begins to work on her degree in social welfare, Jason has his own goals in mind. I plan on going back to school to to culinary school to uh, become a better cook for my family. Jason knows it's a lofty go down a long road, but just like learning how to skate, skate fast. he and Jennifer are confident they can get through his PTSD and turn their lives around.